Hi, everybody. Um, I'm going to talk about my work um, on sensory ambient interfaces. So my name is Jonathan Hanahan. I'm an associate professor of design and the chair of our new MDES for HCI and Emerging Technology program at WashU. Um, I was also until recently uh, this. So I was a Cat 1 cyclist. I would travel the country uh, racing bikes. Um, this was sort of my other day job. Um, and what I love about cycling still is the, the overlap of technology and um, physical experiences. So um, I could geek out for days around um, ideas of equipment, um, data, um, you know, all this sort of stuff. Um, I find it fascinating, right? Um, but as a designer, I always found that this relationship to data on the bike really um, counterintuitive and that every cyclist in a race um, or on the road has all this myriad of data available to them that's relayed to a centralized interface on their handlebars. Um, but in order to access that data, they have to look away from the activity that they're doing, um, essentially compromising their physical safety um, to act on it. And no matter how perfectly elegant uh, and well-designed that interface is, it still requires you to look away from that activity. And so in an environment that is incredibly dynamic and complex with hundreds of racers millimeters from each other taking super technical turns um, at their while they're also at their physical limit, um, trying to uh, the requirement to look down at a thing, uh, visualize it, understand it, and act on it in that situation um, is really counterproductive, right? So obviously, the first solution was this. Let's just put put it on some glasses or put it in front of your face, which is such a non-user-based uh, solution, right? Anybody that has ridden a bike at, in that situation knows that more complexity in front of their face uh, is counterintuitive, right? And so the moment that I saw this um, at the launch of a Vision Pro, I knew that this was the tipping point for um, the the method method of just putting more screens in in physical environments. Um, and I understood that, like as a designer, um, I'm trying to think about what the next phase is going to be that isn't just relying on those screens. So. This question around how do we have a more digitally enhanced future that is less digitally imposing is really uh, what's defining my research right now. And so that led to founding um, the Sail Lab, which is really a design-led lab at WashU looking at um, alternative data integrations and feedback methods, where we're really trying to prioritize non-visual interfaces um, and, um, and alternative senses that relay data without the need of a visual screen. Part of this is built on the idea that um, the visual spectrum is actually not very good at, at picking up on changes in complex data. We've all had that experience where we just sort of like get overloaded and let it sort of wash over us. Um, but other senses, particularly sound and touch, are much better at, at picking up on those differences. So we were trying to think about how do we take, um, how do we use those senses in these situations as primary, not as um, methods to alert us to look at a screen. So there's four principles that, that define this lab. One, we're prioritizing um, what we call compromise experiences, where a screen is either not available, dangerous, or distracting from the task at hand. So examples of this are athletics, um, medicine, defense, safety, all complex environments where the use of data would be valuable, but is often um, unavailable or would be uh, problematic to have it on a screen. Uh, our primary metric for measuring this is this idea of the OODA loop, which um, was developed by an Air Force Colonel, John Boyd, to think about the cycle of how an Air Force pilot, but really anybody in a complex situation, um, is able to observe changes in that situation, orient themselves to it, make a decision, and then act on it. And so that loop is something that um, we are constantly going through, but particular in these types of experiences. And thinking about strategies that can shorten that loop 
and make those de that decision make decision making process more intuitive um, is part of is, is really part of our strategy. As I mentioned, this is sort of a design led lab. So what we're trying to do is really focus not on what are the technologies that allow us to do this and designing new technologies, but really thinking about how do we take the strategies that we use in visual design and apply them to non-visual design. So lots and lots of time and care into the development of patterns that we can then use in different situations. And then lastly, this idea of um, sensory um, experiences that are real time and active and not just blunt um, alerts, right? So um, we use this driving simulator as an example where the steering wheel is constantly vibrating and changing how much it is vibrating based off of the road conditions it's trying to um, represent, right? And so um, the driver of that simulator is actually making minute changes to the way that they're driving based off of that feeling, not because an alert pops up that says, hey, the road is bumpy, do something about it. So how can we make this sort of real time shift um, more present in that process? So our uh, pilot project, which we are currently testing, um, works with the was working with the rowing team at WashU, um, which I think is a really good parallel to the the cycling example, where rowing is a super data intensive sport in training, but often is very traditional in the boat in terms of like they may collect that data, but they have no way to act on it in real time. And rather than chucking a bunch of computers or screens, et cetera, into the boat, we're actually just trying to manipulate and use existing hardware that many of those athletes are already using to collect their data. So can we hack or manipulate uh, or develop a new application that takes that data and relays it in different ways? So this is basically a quick demo of our app where we have um, a user can sort of choose a, a data type that they want to um, they want to track and they set a target for that data type and then a range from that data type. So that might be power, that might be um, um, uh, strokes per minute, that might be heart rate, et cetera. Um, when they're at that threshold, they just get this sort of like reassuring heartbeat pattern. When they move above that um, threshold, that shifts to a much more um, uh, forceful, um, but, but continuous pace, um, pattern that sort of asks them to kind of return. And then when we go below, we actually pick up the intensity to kind of try to bring them back up into that space. And I think our biggest observation through this process was this, the threshold zone, which is actually the most interesting to say, um, you might assume that if I'm doing what I'm supposed to, I don't need any feedback as a user because that's where I'm supposed to be. But with a non-visual interface, what we found is that if there isn't any feedback, um, trust starts to erode. And the user might start to think, is the battery dead? Is it disconnected, et cetera? So we have this just sort of like reassuring reminder pattern that just kind of keeps you on track and, and makes you feel like you're, everything is fine. Just continue what you're doing. Um, so right now we're testing this with um, members of the rowing team, trying to understand which patterns work best at different situations, but also thinking about where on the body um, receiving those patterns makes the most sense. Um, so we found, again, um, when we were testing with runners, um, uh, haptic feedback on the wrist wasn't a problem because very little is going on around your wrist. But on the rower or on the boat, because so much activity is happening around your hands, that that pattern can start to get a little bit muddy. So we've been moving the pattern sort of up the body, body or more central to the body, both on the chest, on the forearm, on the neck, um, but we're also starting to think about how that patterning might actually get integrated into the ore itself, um, because your fingertips are actually the best place to receive um, uh, uh, tactile feedback like that, right? Um, so this is really the sort of first pilot project um, where we're trying to think about building out this toolkit of patterns, locations on the body, um, strategies, et cetera, that we can then start to apply to different compromised uh, experiences that come into the lab. We're really trying to kind of create this toolkit and then encourage um, research from across campus to enter the lab and let us work with them to customize those things um, for their particular uh, need or activity. Uh, so thank